Okay, hi there, avian science. I didn't see a lot of uh, yeses in the chat. I take it that means it was pretty easy once you had a little bit of time to look at everything. I have to say that was pretty clever. Everything kind of looked like it could be. It was very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> First and first off, the bottom one. It's more like the orange moon. This oh, one. Moon. This is the moon. First so one. that's a bird bath, which I think that looks a lot like a moon, except for the fact that you can see some background. Um, something's underneath the bird bath here. Maybe it's a little not completely round. Um, to my eye, that one's pretty obvious. I like this one. It's a mushroom. And of course, to my eye, that's pretty obvious, but I can see how that one would fool people. Um, this doesn't really look like one. This is my favorite. Of course, you know, unfortunately, that's not a moon. The orange one. Um, the color kind of makes me think it's not a moon. And then this one, pretty good. But of course, this is a close up view of the moon, um, the surface of, of the moon, our moon. So I didn't even what, what is a lifting stone? A lifting stone is something that is used in um, weightlifting, basically. So nowadays they have kettle balls, we have a handle on them, but it used to be that people would, would literally lift these weighted round, um, these round rocks that had a specific weight to them. Okay. So, I will be posting some new assignments later this week. Um, theoretically, I'll be posting them on Friday, but notice the big arrows there. The next couple of assignments, as well as requesting a topic and a format for the presentation, all of that's going to be due on Friday, March 24th because next week is spring break. And I'm not gonna give you work to do that you have to do over spring break. So, yay, spring break. Um, so that's the announcements. I have also submitted mid-semester alerts. Most of the students, most of you guys are doing really good in this class. I have two students who are not turning in assignments um, or are missing multiple assignments. And you two will be getting um, notification about, you know, that you're having trouble in the class. I'm gonna send you guys emails a little bit later today um, about that. Speaking of which, I've got to send another email. Okay. So we've been talking about intelligence kind of in general at this point. And we're going to start working a little more. Laura, I sent you an email about that. I never did figure it the answer out, but I did send you an email about that. Oh, okay. Thank um, you. You're welcome. But I want to talk about some of the things that are specifically bird related when we talk about intelligence at this point. So when we look at birds and we 
we compare the intelligence between birds and compare the intelligence of some of the birds to mammals, we see that the corvids, which are crows, ravens, jays, and parrots, those two groups tend to be much smarter than other types of birds. Their intelligence is similar to what we see in the higher primates. And one of the things that seems to be associated with higher levels of intelligence is living in large, complicated social groups, especially when the groups are what are called fission fusion groups. So a fission fusion group, it's the kind of society humans have where if you think about everybody you know, you're not really living in one group, right? You're not interacting with the same people at school that you might interact with at home, or you might interact with different people when you wanna go out and have fun, different people at work. By having these um, societies where people can be in slightly different groups, or might completely leave, maybe you decide to move to sunny Southern California and form new social groups. We call that fission and fusion. The size of the group and the composition of the group changes over time. This means that individuals within that society or within that social group have to be able to recognize more individuals. We have to be able to recognize the people we go to school with, the people we work with, our family members, and we have to know them well enough to know how to interact with them. You're going to interact differently with me than you would with your best friend. I'm going to interact differently with different students. Some students I joke around with because I think they can take a joke and they appreciate it. Some students are more formal, so I'm going to be more formal with you. Um, and and that, that sort of thing. In addition to that, these more intelligent groups, both the corvids, the parrots, and primates, have a long time period before independence. Ah, independence, there we go, that's not right. You're missing a syllable. Independence, there we go. Still doesn't look right. Anyway, close enough. You guys know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so they, D-E-N-C, okay. Thank you. Um, so they stay with their parents for a very long period, relatively long period of time. When we look at corvids and parrots, they will sometimes stay with their parents for multiple years. So it's not just, one year or half a year, like we see when we look at um, songbirds, for example, they tend to stay with their parents for a couple of months. And when fall migration comes, everybody goes their separate ways. We don't see that with corvids or parrots. American crows have been observed remaining with their parents for five years. So that's a really long time period. This means that they can learn more from their parents. It means that they probably have a more complicated lifestyle, meaning they have to learn more from their parents. They need that support before they can get out there. And it also means that they've experienced raising the next generation. raising, you know, the, the younger, the younger siblings there. 
if we have a hummingbird, say you find a baby hummingbird on the ground and it gets hand reared in rehab, it's fine. You don't have to teach it anything. It, it gets everything instinctively. It'll be able to find food, no problem. Off they go. If you get a raven, if you find a, a, a baby raven and it comes into wildlife rehab, this is difficult. Generally, you have to raise ravens with other ravens. If you've only got one, that's a problem. We had one baby raven come in when I was working in wildlife rehab. And um, this was actually in California when I lived here before I lived in Massachusetts. And we were calling all of the rehabbers up and down the state, trying to find somebody who had baby ravens. And nobody else had baby ravens that year. So we were figuring that that baby was going to end up stuck in captivity. He was going to become an education animal, which, you know, that's not the goal of wildlife rehab. But we got lucky. We got an injured adult. <laughs> the injured adult was not badly injured, but we kept the adult until the baby was ready to be released so that the adult and the baby bonded together. They were living in the same cage. They were, you know, interacting regularly. And that way we, when we released the adult, we released it back where we found the adult and we released it with the baby in the hopes that the adult would take the baby under his wing and, you know, help him uh, adapt to life in the wild. We also see that these groups live in highly variable environments. Um, this is particularly true of parrots. Food is going to be available in different places in their environment at different times of the year. And parrots in particular know what time of year various fruit trees tend to fruit. And so they'll go, oh, it's this time of the year, we're gonna go check out this Cecropia tree or that fig tree over there because it's about the right time for them to fruit. So complicated environments um, tend to increase the likelihood that a species will develop intelligence. So we talked about measuring IQ and how in humans we have paper tests. These tests in humans um, are not necessarily completely accurate and they are highly influenced by things like income level, education level, nutritional status, as well as race and sex, which tells you that there's definitely some biases going on in these tests. Are these similar things going to impact the bird IQ tests? Well, they don't have an income, they don't have an education, but certainly age, nutritional level, um, social status within the group, those all can impact an individual bird's success on an IQ test. When we are trying to test birds, they do pretty well when they get positive results, especially food rewards. The food can either be the goal of the test, what they're trying to get, or it can be a reward for participation. Just like dogs, you can use clickers with birds. Clickers work with lots of different animals. So if you've learned how to use a clicker with dog training and food rewards, man, you can, you can do some basic training with lots and lots of different types of animals. 
with a lot of birds, there's something called neophobia that interferes with their ability to participate in these tests. Phobia is a fear, neo is new, so it's fear of new things. You don't see that with all species, but it's common in a lot of birds. Clicker, cricket clicker or button clicker? I don't know. I don't think I've heard the difference between those. Hmm. So I, I can't give you an answer. I don't think it really matters. I know that um, marine mammal trainer, trainers use whistles instead of clickers, but it's the same concept. So because new experiences can sometimes make birds perform poorly on a test, um, researchers tend to work with younger birds who are not as nervous about new situations, especially if they've been raised in captivity. Oh, congratulations, Maddie. Hopefully some of the stuff you've learned here will help. Okay. We also have to pay attention to season. Breeding birds who are, you know, when it's breeding season, all birds care about other hormones. Just, it's just about breeding. And they're not gonna do good on IQ tests. So you've gotta make sure that they're not hormonal. And then there are some species specific issues. There are birds that cache food in the wilds, especially um, some of the jays, and those do very well on memory tests and on planning ahead. Birds that live in, well, that's just general intelligence. These guys here, this is a parrot called a kia. It's a New Zealand species of parrot, probably the smartest parrot, probably the smartest bird in the world. Um, they don't tend to do well in captivity, so we don't tend to have them as captive animals. So we don't have a lot of information on them. We don't have studies where they've looked at their intelligence, but <laughs> there's a problem with these guys. They live up in the mountains in New Zealand and um, they get bored because they're smart. And so when they started trying to do construction on this bridge, they put out traffic cones to get people to, you know, this is the cone story. Yep. The birds would knock over and move the traffic cones. <laughs> so um, that doesn't work really well if you're trying to say, don't drive here and somebody moves the cones. Uh, so they created these jungle gyms by the side of the road where they were doing construction. So this is a Kia only playground to try and distract them so they had something more interesting to do than play with the traffic cones. I have never found whether this worked or not. I bet it didn't. I bet they just ended up playing with both of them. All right. So we're gonna talk about some of the specific skills that birds um, have been tested on and Early work on intelligence in birds really focused in on pigeons and geese. Pigeons, because they're available, they're easy to handle, we know how to take care of them. They don't have neophobia because they're domestic. Geese, because of um, Conrad Lorenz, who did some early psychology work looking at geese. Modern studies, we tend to look at corvids and parrots. What? 
am I doing? Okay, so I'm not quite sure what was going on there. I got some slides out of order. All right, so this slide. This is a cormorant who's got a fish, and these are the fishermen who have trained that cormorant to go fishing for them. This is common in Southeast Asia, and the fishermen put a ring around the cormorant's neck. So in order to get food, the cormorant has to fish for these people. They can't swallow that fish. So they've learned to come back to the fishermen and the fishermen will take seven fish. And when the bird comes back with the eighth fish, they remove the ring and the bird gets the eighth fish. And these cormorants can count to eight, no problem. They bring back that eighth fish and if the fisherman doesn't give it to them, they're not going back in the water. They're not gonna keep fishing. We see that a lot of birds can count to about this range. Um, corvids and parrots, they tend to be able to count to between six and eight. Pigeons can count to seven. Um, it's also common for birds to be able to know how many eggs should be in their nest so they can count the eggs and know the right number. This is a pigeon doing a counting test and they're supposed to, they, they've been trained here to um, tell the difference between a large number of things and a smaller number of things. So this square has eight squares in it. This cluster has nine. This pigeon knows, I'm assuming he's supposed to be going for the higher number and he knows this is, he's looking at it. I don't know, we don't know if they are estimating or if they can count one, two, three, four or their equivalent of it, but they can certainly tell the difference between, even with a difference of just one square there. Many birds have excellent spatial skills, much better than what we tend to see in people. They can find specific locations even after a long time period. So they can find fruiting trees that only fruit once a year. I mentioned that with parrots. They know where the bird feeders are. Go on vacation for two weeks, don't have bird food out, come back, put bird food out, and yet, we're gonna, they're gonna come right back. So birds, when you try and change locations of something, if you're trying to get them to go to a specific target, birds that depend on fruiting trees do better than birds that scavenge for seed or hunt small insects. And that's because if you eat fruit from a tree, the tree is fruity, you go and you gorge. You're not going to go and eat a couple of pieces of fruit and then go over here and eat a couple of things over there and go over here and eat a few things. You're going to go straight to that fruit tree. So they tend to have better ability to um, find specific locations and, and recognize uh, when a target has moved to a new location. Birds can also identify types of objects. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that later. Right now we're gonna talk about recognizing people. <laughs> Many, many types of birds, crows, pigeons, lots of other birds recognize individual humans. And they can say, this is the nice lady who comes to the park and feeds us 
And this is the mean person who throws things at us. And you can guarantee that the pigeons, the crows, whatever, they're gonna come up to the nice person. They're gonna say hi, they're gonna get closer. The mean person, they're gonna stay away. It appears to be through facial recognition, which is really impressing. Birds don't recognize each other's faces, but they can recognize our faces. These are Corvid researchers. <laughs> um, you never piss off crows. <laughs> Never handle a dead crow in front of your neighborhood crows. Crows recognize dead crows. They can tell that they're dead. And if they see you handling one of their local dead crows, guess what? They're gonna assume you killed it. And you're never gonna have a moment of peace. So researchers and banders who work with crows have to wear masks. These kinds of masks, Halloween masks, not like uh, COVID masks. They're hiding their faces. So when they're doing something they, they know is going to annoy the birds. Um, Maddie, would what work? Oh, yeah, no, the masks work. It's not, they're not recognizing the eyes. Would COVID masks work? I don't know if anybody has tested that. Um, certainly, I would think that if you did a, any kind of full face covering, um, that should do the job there. But um, the research that's been done on it has been done on these types of masks. There's an island off the coast of Maine called Appledore Island. The gulls that are on that island have been studied for decades now, and they breed on the island. So researchers go to this island and they catch the birds and they get blood samples and they band them. And there's other research that goes on on this island. So there's lots of researchers on this island. The gulls will attack the gull researchers and only the gull researchers. So you can tell who the goal researchers are because they're walking around wearing bicycle helmets all day. People who don't work with them, no problem. I would not be surprised to find out crows and ravens, something happened that uh, caused them to recognize a police uniform and go after police, yeah. Yeah, that would not surprise me in the least. Um, pigeons have also been able to recognize facial expressions. So they don't even have to know you, but they can tell the difference between somebody who is smiling and somebody who is scowling. So if you're going around with your man face on, pigeons are not gonna let you get close to them. But if you look happy and friendly, they're gonna wait a little longer before they get out of your way. Pigeons have also been able to put things into categories. So we can, I love this, that you can use computer screens and pigeons can do this kind of test. They can pick out all of the pictures of the same type of object, say all of the dogs. They don't have to be the same dog, they just all have to be dogs and pigeons can pick this out. Parrots can do this as well. Um, not only on a computer screen, but also with three-dimensional objects. Even more impressive, some birds, pigeons, and some parrots can recognize that a symbol means something else. So when they were doing the images of dogs testing with pigeons, to let the birds know what they were supposed to pick out, they trained them to associate a triangle with a picture of a dog. And so if a bunch of pictures came up on the screen and you showed them a triangle, they'd pick out all the dogs. If you showed them a circle, 
and maybe circles with cars, they'd pick out all the cars. So they could make that association. Now, communication is one of the issues we have with testing intelligence in animals. Pigeons have an advantage. Pigeons can speak and a lot of them can understand spoken words. Now, a lot of birds can speak and they're just mimicking sounds. They're just repeating something they've heard. But you can train them to understand what those words mean. Which, I mean, that makes sense. Birds use vocalizations to communicate lots of things with each other. Breeding, territory, um, they have different calls for different types of predators. So they'll have one call that means there's a, a hawk flying over and another call that means a snake on the ground. Both are predators, but you have to react differently to avoid those predators. We also see that birds can do something called social learning. This is more common, pigeons can speak. No, pigeons can't, but parrots and some corvids can. Okay, okay. Um, although my mother had a canary that learned to say one word. Uh, it learned from their parakeet. So their parakeet was named Jerry and Jerry would repeat his name over and over and over all day long. Jerry, 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 Jerry. And the canary learned how to say Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Uh, Maddie, go ahead. Um, I saw a video of, I don't remember if it was a crow or a raven, um, but they sounded like a human. Um, like they didn't have like the parrot voice. They just sounded straight like a human. Mm -hmm. Is that still them mimicking or did they know what they were saying? I couldn't say without knowing more about the individual bird. Um, it's just a bird. It just kept saying hello, but it literally, it almost sounded like an AI voice. It just sounded like hello. That was probably just mimicking then if it was okay. saying the same thing over and over. That makes sense. It was just so creepy because <laughs> like, yeah. no, I didn't expect this. I mean, it's this like large all black bird and it sounds like, like something you'd hear out of a horror movie behind you. <laughs> I love that. I was like, oh God. Yeah, they can get very good, especially the Corvids. They can get much better at imitating the accurate sounds of human speech. Okay, social learning. Um, there's a couple of things that we do that we test with social learning with. Social learning really means learning by watching others. Somebody is demonstrating something to you. The example I've got, and I think this was in the video I recommended, the bird brains video, parrots would observe another parrot solving a puzzle box. And this puzzle box had multiple solutions to it, but the pigeons who, I'm sorry, the parrots who were observing the other parrot solve the puzzle would solve it the same way as what they observed. So they would do the same thing that the parrot who, had, who was demonstrating the solution that is the way they would do it. So they clearly learned by watching. They didn't have to do trial and errors. They didn't go for a different way to solve the problem. They just went straight for the way the previous one had done. We see it in crows too. Crows in the common area seem to have what we would call almost culture. They would have specific, they will have specific ways of solving problems. So if a single crow learns to solve a problem, pretty soon all the crows in the area have figured out how to solve that problem. Well, crows in other areas might have different solutions to the same problem or no solution at all. 
cockatoos in Australia are, oh, they're so destructive. Um, there's a huge problem with them getting into trash cans. And the locals have tried all of these different tricks to try and make it hard or impossible for the, the cockatoos to get into the trash. But as soon as one figures it out, it spreads out from there. And it's like everybody nearby says, oh, I see they got into the trash. How did they do that? And they learn from watching. And it spreads, you know, outward in an expanding circle. This is an example of cooperation. So this is using your social group to achieve an individual goal. What's going on here is these parrots are having to work together to get food. In this instance, this parrot is exchanging this metal washer, this little ring here, for food, but the washer was not in his enclosure. It was in the enclosure of this, this parrot's area. So you can see this parrot has washers over here. But this parrot doesn't get rewarded if he hands the washer to the person. This parrot gets rewarded if he hands the washer to the other parrot, and that parrot hands the washer to a person. So if they work together and the person gets the washer, both parrots get a food reward. And we saw this in the video, I don't know how many of you watched it, with um, basically a teeter-totter kind of, or, or uh, yeah, teeter-totter sort of thing where you've got a, a straight line and you've got a little basket on one end and the other end is covering a box with food. And the parrot has to get in the little box on this end and the weight of the parrot shifts the seesaw so that it opens the food box. And the parrots will take turns sitting in the box to open the food box for the others. So nobody gets um, all of the food and, and, or gets left out of getting the food. We see tool use. So lots of different birds have been shown to use tools in various ways. A tool is a physical object used to achieve a goal. And it is, it's seen in some primates, it's seen in lots of different bird species, lots of different bird types, so you'll see this in things that aren't crows or parrots. This particular example, using a stick to try and get at some food in a, in a cavity in a tree or from under bark in a tree, very, very common. Lots of birds will use hard surfaces to crack open hard food. So if you think of hard nuts, or clams or crabs, these sorts of things, birds will fly over, they'll drop the clam or the crab onto a hard surface, like a road or a rock, and then they'll fly down to get the food out. This has been seen in not just corvids, but also in gulls. Gulls are very good at this. Crows take it a step further. Crows in both Japan and the US, so these birds are not, they don't know each other, will drop clams or nuts into road crosswalks. So not just dropping it on the road, but dropping it in a crosswalk that's been marked. The drop may not be enough to open the food, but when the cars go through, 
there's a good chance that somebody's going to drive over that clam or the nut. And then when traffic stops for the red light, the crow comes down and gets the food. So not only are they using a tool, they understand that cars stop and that when the cars are stopped, it's safe for them to enter the crosswalk, which is just amazing. Herons and egrets have been used, uh, have, have been observed using bait to attract fish. They'd rather eat the fish, so they might drop uh, pieces of bread. Somebody's, you know, feeding the ducks. Please don't feed the ducks bread. Don't feed the crows bread. Bread is not good for the digestive tract of birds. But herons and egrets don't care. They pick up that bread, they drop it in the water, and fish come up to eat it. And, there's lunch. I like this video. It's going to take a minute for me to get us there, where crows are learned to use a vending machine. Okay, hang on just a second. Let me get the screen share to the right place. So you can see there's some food sitting here on top of these quarters. This crow has come down and discovered there's food. Um, I think this is probably dry cat food. Lots of animals like cat food. <laughs> now he's picked up the quarter. He's trying to figure out what to do with it. And he didn't figure it out. So here's somebody who's resetting the device. This is a little while later. The crows have had a chance to learn how to use it. Oh, look, there are quarters. And now he's putting the quarter in the slot or in the hole and he gets his food reward. The really fun part, I mean, this is, this is pretty darn impressive. And they kept moving the quarters further away from the box and the crows would go and find it. Uh, unfortunately, they eventually found the car wash that was nearby. And this was back in the days where you always used quarters to feed the car wash and people would stack up a, a bunch of quarters on top of the uh, pay box and you know feed them in as they needed to, to get more water or whatever. And these crows learned to go and steal those quarters to get food. So not only did they learn how to figure out the- was mad because he didn't get the food and took the quarter. <laughs> okay. Um, one species of crow called the New Caledonian crow, these are probably the smartest of the corvids. They've been tested on a lot of different intelligence tests. And in the wild, as well as in captivity, they have been, oh, Betsy's having a hard time with the internet today. Um, they have been observed modifying things for tool use. So they will take 
in, in captivity situations, they'll take a metal wire and bend it into a hook. And they've been seen to do similar things with, with um, leaves and branches in the wild. And now I wanna talk about African gray parrots. Specifically, I wanna talk about this African gray parrot. This African gray parrot is Alex. You may have heard about them, him. Um, when we do intelligence testing in animals, there can be controversy around it. So there are some people who will say, the animal didn't really understand how to do that. You just wanted it to be that way and you misinterpreted the results. So there's this accusation that some of the results are wishful thinking. And certainly in some cases that it, some researchers that that does happen. It's very difficult not to impose what you want over what happens and and you know kind of exaggerate the skills of the animal you're studying um and then the other extreme is that some people think that animals are not intelligent thinking they're just basically machines with feathers or fur. So we get these two extremes. Animals are machines. Animals are basically just, just like humans, except they have fur or feathers. Neither of those extremes is right. They're somewhere in the middle. They're not machines. They're not just like children. So. Alex was an African gray parrot that was used by a woman named Dr. Irene Pepperberg. And she put him through a series of tests to try and figure out with as little bias as possible how intelligent parrots are. So to, to reduce her bias, she went to a pet store that had a whole bunch of hand reared African grays. She went to the clerk and said, I want an African gray. You pick it out. So the clerk picked out the African gray. She worked very hard to make sure that she couldn't be accused of bias. So she would do things like, she taught Alex to talk. So his answers were all verbal and they were his answers. And the person administering the test would be in front of Alex, but the person who was recording Alex's answers could not see the test. They were in the other end of the room with their back turned so that if she held up an object, say she held up a toy truck and said, Alex, what is this? And Alex would go, truck. It wasn't the person holding up the truck who was recording what he said, it was somebody else. So they had to be able to understand him. And um, because they weren't observing the test, that was gonna be an unbiased evaluation. She basically used a process called modeling, which uses jealousy. So food rewards, yeah, that's good, but she would have one of her students act out the result that she wanted, naming the object, counting objects, um, describing the color, choosing an object, this sorts of thing. Then she would reward the student and then Alex would watch that and then use social learning and mimic what the student had done. And that's how she trained him. Alex knew the meaning of over 100 words. 
including some abstract kind of concepts. So he knew words like bigger, smaller, same, different. These are kind of a little bit abstract. They're not just knowing the names of objects. He knew seven different colors. He knew five different shapes. He could identify over 50 objects, trucks, keys, squares, triangles, even if those objects were different sizes or different colors. He could count to six. Remember earlier we talked about a lot of birds, that six to eight range seems to be the, the where they can count. Um, but he also under, under, understood none or zero. So if you said how many trucks and there weren't any trucks, he would say none. So this would be one of his testing trays. So there's this little, little tray and you can see it's got numbers on it and the numbers are all different colors. And so he might be asked uh, which one is green and have to pick up the green one. He could ask for specific food items. So if you wanted him to do a test and he didn't like the food you were offering, he might go, want a peanut? or Alex want a peanut if he wanted to go somewhere else and quit testing for the day he would say that if he wanted to be to get attention if he wanted to get scratched he could ask for that he could understand optical illusions he understood the concept of object permanence so object permanence permanence is something we tend to learn about two I think it's two years of age. And it's the idea that if I hold up an object and then I put it behind my back and you can't see it, that that object still exists. He was estimated to have an intelligence level of around a four-year-old. I think that's probably a bit of an exaggeration and the emotional maturity of a two-year-old. I don't think that was an exaggeration. We tend to see this with a lot of the big parrots, the cockatoos, the parrots, the macaws, they tend to have the emotional maturity of a toddler, which is, yeah, if you've got a bird who's gonna live to be 50, 60, 80 years old, and they are a toddler their whole lives, there's a reason I don't have parents. Um, unfortunately, he died relatively young. He died of heart disease at age 31. African greys usually can live up to, you know, 60. 60, not 16, 60. So despite everything, there's been lots of controversy over Dr. Pepper Burke's results. Kinley, are you talking about um, Max the cockatoo, Mr. Max? Yeah, the owner said he had the same um, behaviors. He acts like a two-year-old. Yep, exactly. So. Roni, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to tell my favorite Max story, which was that um, Dr. Pepperberg brought a friend who is also an animal scientist into her lab. And she put a tray in front of him and asked him how many green there were. And the answer was three. And he said two. And she said, no, Alex, how many green? And he said four. And he just kept going back and forth between two and four. And finally, she was like, okay, you don't want to play. We're going to leave. And as she was walking out the door, he went, three, sorry, three. <laughs> He was acting up for company. <laughs> um, so a lot of people don't think that she proved what she claims to have proved. Um, a lot of people say the results are just what we call operant conditioning. 
which is basically the kind of training that we do nowadays with the food reward. This kind of thing has been seen with other star animals, some of which were just operantly conditioned. Um, just so um, there was a famous horse that was supposed to be able to count and do simple math. And uh, it turned out that his owner was moving his foot when he wanted the animal to quit pawing at the ground. So, um, you know, that one was pretty obvious. Sometimes the handler is not aware that they're giving a signal. They are, but the, they're not aware of it because it can be something like, you know, just relaxing a little bit when the animal gets the answer right. That's, that can be a clue for the animal. Until this research can be repeated by other researchers, there are going to be doubts. In fact, even then there will be doubters. Um, this was a very expensive project. It was a long-term research project. She worked with Alex for over 30 years. Nowadays, most research is done in groups of animals. So we have internal, um, more than one individual that's being tested within the same test um, facility and procedure and by the same researchers. But at the very least, it's clear from what Dr. Pepperberg did that birds are much more intelligent than most people give them credit for. All right. So We've been talking about intelligence, specifically in the smart animal, smarter birds. And one of the things that I want you guys to think about, whether you're working with birds or you're just being a professional who gives advice to other people who might be interested in having a pet bird, or if you want a pet bird, think about the intelligence level of these parrots, many of them who are kept in captivity as pets, and then think about how much mental stimulation they need. You know, if you've got a canary, I like canaries, but they're not very smart. <laughs> they don't need nearly as much mental stimulus as an African gray who could theoretically learn to count, recognize colors and, and uh, numbers and shapes and all of that stuff and talk in simple sentences. So this next section is kind of, we're transitioning into this behavior part. I'm gonna talk a little bit here about wild birds and how their life in the wild is and how this relates to them as a pet. Dogs were domesticated, this highly controversial exactly when they were domesticated. They were the first animal domesticated, and the latest estimates are saying about 30,000 years ago. Cats were domesticated. They were part of the big wave of domestication that took place between 10 and 12,000 years ago. This was about the same time period we were starting to farm. We domesticated horses. Not long after that, we domesticated uh, cows and pigs and goats and sheep and all of that stuff. When we look at the domesticated species, these are not the parrots that everybody seems to think that they want as pets. Those guys have not been domesticated. They haven't been kept in captivity long enough. But we can look at chickens. 
chickens were domesticated seven to 10,000 years ago. Pigeons, at least 5,000 years ago. If you've dealt with wildlife, wild birds, and you've dealt with pigeons and chickens, you know pigeons and chickens, they're just much more laid back than wild animals. They behave very, very differently. The canary, the earliest uh, sign of canaries being domesticated is a painting from 1490. And at that point, they had already been bred to have different colors than the wild ones. Wild canaries are not solid yellow. Budgies were domesticated in the mid 1800s. And the zebra finch was also domesticated sometime in the mid 1800s. So those are the species, the most common species that, that uh, I would call domesticated. I would say that their behaviors are not the same as their wild cousins. They have some behavioral similarities, but they're not going to experience the same amount of stress that, say, an African gray parrot. They're going to be more tolerant of handling. And they're just going to do better as, as pets. All right. So sorry, this was supposed to be the slide we were looking on. So here's our, our diversity of chickens. Here's a fancy pigeon. Fancy pigeons can really, they get, they're just some ridiculous looking birds. If you're bored sometimes, spend some time Googling fancy pigeons. Um, here's our budgies in lots of different colors that aren't seen in the wild. Okay, but when we talk about birds in the wild, first off, they are very active. They often have large habitats, a long range of area that they fly around and through. Now, this is gonna vary between species. It's gonna vary between situations. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples here trying to go with um, some of the better known ones. If we look at the big birds, the cockatoos, the macaws, the Amazon parrots, they tend to fly approximately five miles on a day. So think about that. If you've got a macaw in your house, it is not flying five miles every day like its wild cousins do. Surprisingly, we see similar distances in wild budgies and cockatiels. So we'll see those guys flying multiple miles every single day. Now, if a pet bird escapes, they tend not to take off and fly five miles on their first escape. You know, it's probably like what you would see with a kid. Woohoo, I'm out here. I'm getting to do what I want to do. I get to go up in this fancy tree. And then it's like, oh shit, now what? And so usually if they are found, they are found within one mile of their home. They don't, they're not familiar with the area. They don't know how to find food. They're not in as good a physical condition as a wild. In the wild, birds are constantly occupied looking for food. Their food does not get delivered on a plate every day unless they're eating from a bird feeder in somebody's backyard. This means that wild birds, even wild birds that come to bird feeders tend to have a significantly more diverse diet than captive birds. There's a lot of different things that they can find and eat, different seeds that have different nutrition levels. They can add in 
seasonal foods, which we tend not to do with pet birds. Um, so it's got a much, much more diverse diet. Another thing that we see in wild birds is that they fly into windows. It sucks. We all hate it. There are some things that you can do. They have UV stickers that you can put on your window. They're not completely transparent. Um, you can kind of see them, but you can still see through them. They're not, not like putting black paint or you know, black stripes on your windows. Um, closing the blinds at certain times of the day can help. So you're trying to do things so the bird doesn't fly into the window thinking that it's flying into, you know, it sees a reflection of trees or something. Well, guess what? Your bird's flying around your house, same problem. They don't understand windows. So you need to be careful to make sure that your bird doesn't fly into the window when it's flying free in the house. Window strikes are a major, major cause of death for migrating birds, um, migra migrating songbirds in particular. Songbirds migrate at night and these tall office buildings are up in their flight path and these are pretty dangerous. During migration, if you walk around, if you go down into Boston and walk around the base of the tall buildings first thing in the morning, you're gonna find dead birds. Um, which is frustrating because there's an easy fix. Office buildings where they turn off all the lights inside have very few bird strikes at night. It's the ones that have lights on that have the most bird strikes. The other thing you have to be aware of if your um, bird is flying free in the house, I'm just putting this in here right now because I was talking about free flight, close the toilet lid. They don't, um, they won't be able to get out if they fall into the toilet. Ronit, it looked like you were typing something. I, I was uh, messaging on a, our bird um, almost landed in the fish tank once. Oh, yes. Yes, fish tanks can be a hazard too. <laughs> in the wild, birds are very, very social. These are mixed flocks. Um, from the Amazon rainforest in Peru. This particular one is at a, um, well, these are both in Manu National Park in Peru, which is one of the most amazing places. I've been there. It takes two days on a boat. <laughs> Once you have landed your airplane in this remote, relatively remote village, it takes two days on a boat to get down there. Um, the location of the research center, Tambapata, is, oh, somebody else has heard of it. And your mom's been there. Oh, yes, it was amazing. If once you are going down the river, there's a point where you're not allowed to go past that point unless you're going to the research center. That's it. That's the only place you're allowed to go. And past the research center, you're not allowed to go at all. So it's really as close to being in the middle of nowhere as you can get. And you can see these huge flocks of birds and you can see these mixed flocks. So you can see there's some blue and gold macaws and some blue-headed parrots, and this is a different type of parrot. 
the different species of parrot, these are mini macaws here. Notice how they're kind of clustered with one species in this cluster and one species in that cluster. Regardless, they're in these large social flocks. African gray parrots can be in flocks between 20 and 20 and 50 individuals. Other parrots, these flocks can ha be, have hundreds or thousands of individuals. Individual birds in a flock will usually have a mate. Their mate, um, they spend the year with their mate. They basically spend their lives with their mate. They also have close friends. So if they're not spending time with their mate, they're spending time with their friends. Regardless, there are always, always other birds within, usually within sight. If they're in dense jungle, they're at least within hearing range and they're calling to each other. So they're never alone. Most bird species that we keep in captivity do not do well without company. Company can be other birds. To some degree, it can be people. Many species will, just like in the wild, even if they have a, a social group of people, they'll pick one person to be their person. And that's the one that they're going to do mutual grooming with. That's the one they're going to spend the most time with. In parrots, this can result in very severe separation anxiety. So if their person goes to work, goes on a vacation, that's when we start seeing the pet bird having destructive and harmful behaviors. especially things that we have not seen before. We talked about the Kia uh, getting bored and you know messing with the traffic cones. Well, <laughs> that's not the only species that does that kind of stuff. We see signs of boredom in wild birds, especially young wild birds. Parrots, cockatoos, even vultures. So on our left, we have a black vulture tearing up a windshield wiper, <laughs> pulling the rubber off of windshield wipers. Um, these, these different types of birds, the vultures, the cockatoos, the parrots, have all been known to damage cars. If you go to like the Everglades during the winter time when all the vultures are concentrated down there. There are some places where um, if you park your car, you better have a blue plastic tarp and some um, bungee cords to, to fasten it to your car. Otherwise you're not gonna have thing. They're gonna literally pull off anything they can get their beak on, anything rubber. They'll do a lot of damage there. Um, cockatoos are a huge problem in Australia. They pull out the rubbery type seal around windows. And so literally windows will fall out of buildings. They chew on wires, power outages, losing your cable, losing your internet. They'll tear up siding. This guy is pulling up a, a set of parrot spikes, which were put on the, uh, put outside the window to try and keep the cockatoos away. And he's like, eh, yeah, that's just another toy. And I've already talked about them with uh, the trash cans. So if boredom is a problem with wild birds, it's also a problem with pet birds. Oh my God, I just looked at the clock. You guys gotta stop me when I'm rambling. All right, we're gonna come back and talk about boredom in captive birds on Thursday. Any questions or comments before we wrap up here?
Nothing? All right, then I'll see you guys next time.